Hi, and welcome to another edition of Danny Brown Talks Phoenix. I am your host, Danny Brown, and today I'm joined by Josh Norris of Aftershock Digital. Welcome to the show, Josh. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for uh, for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your company and what you do. Yeah, um, so Danny mentioned Josh Norris. I'm actually a, a native of Arizona, just like yourself. Which is uh, rare in your mid-30s. Totally. Uh, in fact, I'm second generation uh, uh, native of Arizona. That's my even more was, rare. I know. My dad was born in Bisbee, <laughs> mining town, and then I was born in Safford, a sub-mining town. Uh, so I've been here forever. Um, you know, I grew up in uh, Chandler primarily in my teenage years. Went to Chandler High, and then you know I've I've always just kind of been somewhat business minded. So at 19, I started my first little venture, um, and on in addition to that, I, I worked in marketing for health clubs, and that's kind of what led me down the marketing path. And I started AfterShock Digital a little over 10 years ago. That today is a full service digital marketing agency. We help um, all kinds of different customers and different verticals, um, you know, grow their business. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Digital marketing is, is such a strange thing. Uh, mm-hmm. that's kind of just recently evolved and, and what seems like overnight, but obviously it's been, you know, different generations. So what got you into, uh, wanting to do digital marketing kind of as a career path? Yeah. So I'll take you back kind of my start in marketing back in the health clubs. Uh, it was about as far from digital as possible. So yeah. I worked for Valley Tunnel Fitness and my job was to go out and do marketing in the community with contest box to generate leads of people that'd be interested in a health club membership. I remember seeing like LA fitness ones and stuff at like Nello's Mm -hmm. and pizza places and you'd fill out the little piece of paper and stick it in there. So there's a chance between uh, 2000 and 2007. If you saw a Bally's or pure fitness box, it was either put out by me personally or, (laughs) or by one of my guys. Um, so that was one of the pieces of what we did in marketing is we'd put out these boxes and, you know, people would go into a fast food restaurant or pizza place, like you said, they'd fill it out. And then what we would do once a week, we'd go around, we'd collect the leads and we'd walk into the gym and the, the GM would stand up and be like, <laughs> we were delivering manna from heaven. They were so excited because they knew those were the leads. Um, but the challenge with that was they could be at least a day delayed up to seven days delayed, depending on when it was collected. Yeah. Uh, and granted you had your Mickey mouses and some things I can't say that people would put on there, <laughs> which we still get that in digital marketing now. Absolutely. It's just on a website now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but I, I used to think there's gotta be a better way to this. There's gotta be a way to do it quicker. And in 2008, yeah, 2008, I came up with a digital product um, that was similar to what we had contest boxes, but there were displays and text marketing was brand new. And we just paired text marketing with the company we use, third party, and then we built a mobile website. So somebody could text in uh, their phone number if they were interested in the seven day pass. And once they got a bounce back text, it would be a, a link to that mobile site and they could fill out the rest of the information. That's pretty innovative. I mean, for 2008, uh, it, it, it was. And at that time, we had been contracted by Pure Fitness after I left Gannett. Um, and now I wasn't an employee of Pure Fitness anymore. They had contracted me to come in. I put this in place and it really took off. Uh, it was amazing. What, what they loved was it was real-time leads. That sure. really didn't exist so much in the gym space anyway. It did in real estate mortgage at that point. Um, so it was, a, it was a great product. It was a lot of fun. And, you know, we got the contract for all 10 of the health clubs out here. But the next thing you know, they sold their, their company. So we lost our biggest contract. <laughs> and I had hooked up with a gentleman who was building websites and it helped out with the mobile website. And he and I did some work together. Um, and I'm like, you know, if he can build websites, I think I could learn to do that. And I had a side business um, selling basically supplements online, mm-hmm. thing called Perfect Water. And I started looking at pay-per-click marketing. So with pay-per-click marketing, I was like, you know, there's sounds like you're following the Tim Ferriss, uh, funny enough, (laughs) career path. That's exactly what it was. (laughs) So at the old, uh, the old apartment complex we used to live in had a basketball court and I basketball is what I love. And I had been playing the night before and I busted my ankle. So I'm sitting there doing nothing. I had the Tim Ferriss book for our work week, first time I'd ever read it. And I'm reading, you know, how you create an audience, how you test online, pay-per-click and all that. And I'm like, oh, well, why don't I just sell my product, pay-per-click? Let's try it out. So 
So I did, and in a short order, I think I lost 250 bucks over the weekend. Uh, made one sale though, and I'm like, okay, let's figure out how I can get better at sure. this. And with that, I ended up selling a ton of that product, and that was kind of my pay-per-click um, introduction. And after that, I mean, I did it for other companies, which is the beginning of what Aftershock was. So for, for people listening who may not know what pay-per-click marketing mm-hmm. is, can you kind of give us a little bit of a definition? Yeah. You bet. Um, pay-per-click, the way I like to describe it, is intentional marketing. What they're typically talking about is somebody who goes on Google, being Yahoo, they make a search, they're intentionally searching for something, and we show them an ad up at the top. And it's very relevant to what they just searched, mm-hmm. and then we take them somewhere relevant so that they can get that product or service or try it out. So then when somebody Googles something, you know, uh, for me, you know, homes for sale in Phoenix, mm-hmm. those things that pop up first or along the side of the window, mm-hmm. someone's paying to be there? Yeah, exactly. So um, about a year and a half ago, Google made a big change. They mm-hmm. took away all the side ads that we used to see. So now there's just the I top. I haven't even noticed that. <laughs> right. A lot of people don't. I mean, I ignore the ads and usually go down to the organic stuff uh, right. for the most part. but. And I hear that all the time. So people say, <laughs> well, do anybody actually click on the ads? Well, I will tell you, the number one revenue source for Google is are those ads. That's sure. exactly why they, they make so much money. Um, but what they did was they replaced all those side ads. They added one more position of, of sponsored ads at the top, and then they already had four at the bottom. And now they're adding one to the map listings. You'll see usually the top map listing is also an ad as well. Oh, damn it. I click on that all the time. Yeah. So a lot <laughs> of times you don't even know, you know you're, you're clicking, you're on, clicking an ad. on these ads. So. Yeah, that's basically what pay-per-click marketing is. And if, if you do it right, um, what happens is your quality score, uh, which is determined by the relevancy of your keyword, your ad, your landing page, and then your click-through rate. Your quality score will go up. And it's a scale from 1 to 10. The higher it is, the less you pay per click because it all works on an auction. So if I bid a dollar and you bid $2, you're going to be above me. Mm-hmm. But if you've got a really high quality score and somebody clicks on you, you could pay just a penny more than me, a dollar one. If you got a bad quality score, you could basically pay all your all $2. That's really interesting. Um, so who's paying for those ads and what do they get when you click on them? Yeah, so there are businesses that... Um, benefit from that kind of traffic, people that are searching for those things. So in a real estate space like yourself, mm. you know, you could pay for an ad for the homes for sale in Phoenix and you would send them to a page that's got homes for sale. Usually like in real estate, we'll usually show them the newest listings or if it's a neighborhood, newest listings in that neighborhood. And then, you know, you, you just send them somewhere very relevant with real estate relevance is just the properties itself. And then when they click on it, you're going to ask for their information at some point. But if you're looking for, um, you know, a gym near you, you might throw out a guest pass. You take them to a guest pass site, they download it. Now, you know, you've generated a lead. So can any business then do pay-per-click marketing so that they can be ranked higher on Google? Absolutely. Um, Every business can. And one of the things we do with every business we work with is we kind of find out who their audience is, what their goals are. And believe it or not, pay-per-click really isn't for every business. A lot of your business to consumer, uh, that is usually where pay-per-click is very strong. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of B2B, it's a lot more difficult, uh, still can be done, uh, but you just don't find as many businesses doing pay-per-click marketing effectively. So it's usually a B2C play. So how does someone then do pay-per-click marketing effectively? So effectively, you need to you need to know what you're doing, and let me give you some some guidelines of. And that usually how we means hiring someone that knows what well, they're hiring, doing. Hiring an expert, <laughs> right? Um, so I mentioned the quality score. So that's the one thing we're always working on is trying to get our quality score as high as possible, so that we're paying less per clicks. Then you're also looking for longer tail keywords that are generating uh, better conversions than some of the shorter. So let me give you an example. You said homes for sale in Phoenix, but what I could say is a long tail keyword, homes for sale in Phoenix, three bedroom, two bath, and maybe even a zip code. That's super long tail, not as many people searching for that, but we also know that if we send them to a very relevant page that's got exactly that, Mm -hmm. chances are we're gonna convert a lot better on that too. Um, It's almost like finding your niche, but in 
searches. Exactly. So the more, almost the more detailed you are, the higher your conversion rate probably is. A hundred percent. And then, you know, there's what's called a search terms uh, query. And these are actually the search queries that people are looking for. So you can have a keyword like that, but it might show up for a very variety of different things depending on what's called a match type. You've got broad match, which keeps it, I mean, is real loose in what they'll show it for. You've got phrase match, means your exact phrase has to show up somewhere in that search query. And then you've got exact match. A lot of people just broad match it. So you've got all kinds of things that are showing your ads, getting... Uh, people to your site that aren't converting. So we look at negative keywords from the search terms. So we see things that are like, wow, we had 50 clicks on that. Didn't convert one person, no sales from that. So we'll make that a negative keyword so that it won't show, it won't trigger ads from that point on. So it sounds like your process is constantly evolving as people searches evolve. Absolutely. Um, in the real estate space, our negative keyword list is over 1,250, just to give you an idea. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So what is, you know, what's the difference? Uh, some of the stuff I think we're getting into the weeds with some really, uh, yeah. you know, jargon and, and things that are probably above a lot of people's heads and kind of boring. So yeah. uh, what what is the difference between, you know, PPC, pay-per-click and SEO or search engine optimization? And what's the future hold for, if, uh, it feels like these are two competing, you know, ideologies. Um, so what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, SEO is important. Is it as important as it once was? I'm going to say no. And the reason it's not as important as it once was is because Google's doing everything it can to make sure that their advertisers are showing up and they're getting a majority of those clicks. Adding one more position, adding a position in maps. Now, all those organic ones for people like yourself that like to scroll down, yeah, it's still very beneficial to be towards the top. So what's changed over the last couple of years is they've gone extremely local. And they focus on local searches, making sure that if you are optimized, and let's say you've got 36 of the biggest um, different directories out there, Yelp, Mana, City, City Search, so on and so forth, and it's got all these same information about you know your building location, your phone number, services you offer, and that says, hey, these people do that, Chances it are on the local side, you got a good chance at coming up. Uh, like yesterday, I'll give you an example. I had a call from somebody that needed a new website. We don't get a ton of those calls because there's a lot of digital agencies out there. And there's a lot of places you can just make your own websites 100%. Now. But she said, yeah, I looked online for website design in Tempe, and we happened to, to show up. She called us. Two years ago, not a chance because they didn't have those map listings uh, predominant where that's exactly what she clicked on is, is that map listing. Um, so SEO is important, um, something you want to do because people say it's a free click, but usually they're hiring a company like us to help get those free clicks. So it's not, it's not free completely. So, you know, somebody's starting a business and the first thing that you need when you start a business mm -hmm. is obviously a web page. Right. And so, you know, you see all these commercials and ads for Wix and is it Square and... Yeah. Uh, anyway, all these different platforms where you mm -hmm. can just supposedly easily design your own website. It sounds like it's more than just designing a website that you need to be aware of. It is. Um, anytime you're going to be starting a new website, the first thing you have to do is start with who's your audience? Who's going to be coming to my website? Then you go to what's the intention that I want people to, to get when they're here? If it's a restaurant, you want to see food, you want to see menu, you want to see location. Uh, if you offer a service to where people can take it out, you want to have an easy access for them to purchase. Uh, but great pictures, social media, a lot of social proof, very important. As a real estate company, completely different. And it depends on what kind of real estate website you would want. Yeah. You know, if you're talking about Myriad and, and how great you've done by your customer and you guys have done an incredible job, then you're going to be, it's more of a, a showcase type of website, not something they're going necessarily to search because you can use that as a, uh, a piece to showcase what your past business is. Now, on the flip side, if they're just That's looking... That's we have two different websites. <laughs> if they're just looking to search homes, they don't care who you are. Right. Right? So it depends on the intent. So yes, there are a lot of those build-it-yourself services, but people start with the wrong intention. They're not looking at their audience or what they want their audience to do there. Um, and if you've never done it before, you're really doing a ton of guessing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the first impression, I always say it's the... Um, basically, it's your new front door these days, right? So if you want your new front door to have a positive step forward, then I would hire you know an expert or at least consult with them and 
most people have one as a friend or family member or right. something. At least everybody gets designs advice. websites now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> How much does it cost to work with an expert to make sure that you are doing it right the first time? Yeah. Um, if you're talking about on a consulting basis, typically consulting in our industry is anywhere between 100 to 300 an hour. Uh, and that's kind of here's what we would lay out for you to do yourself. Uh, for a company to build out a website for you, you're typically looking between 100 and 150 uh, for a, a not heavy website development side, meaning mm -hmm. you know, you're not building out a complete new CRM in the back end or uh, you don't need a whole lot of outside functionality other than form and maybe some basic sales. Okay. What about, you know, all the, the language and verbiage that needs to go into that? Does, it, does your company help people write that or do they need to basically be able to, to fill that in on their own? Absolutely. So we help write that. So Amelia in our office, she, uh, she's had a copywriting background for a long, long time. Now she's my executive assistant, but she does so much at Aftershock. And recently over the last year we started offering our copywriting services and we've had a, a lot of great experience with it and we've been able to rank organically quicker with most of the sites we're building out because she's building it with the right intention meaning that um, just real quick and I don't want to get too much in the weeds but with SEO your whole goal is to be as searchable as possible for the things you want to show up for with Google mm. to be as readable as possible so making sure that your content is speaking to that uh, while you're writing it is very important so we do that in the intake process when we're sitting down with someone and finding out you know what the about page there's a lot of things people miss on the about page that you can gear more towards the area the type of service you mm. offer rather than just talking about you right so we take all that in consideration and having a professional copywriter can put you leaps ahead when Absolutely. it comes to SEO. I couldn't agree with you more. Having somebody that knows how to write copy is so impactful. I mean, I'm a terrible writer and so I've got, you know, my You're person who uh, <laughs> I, I read your letter every year. It's fantastic. I'm not the one who writes it. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when you're when you're designing these things, is there a different, you know, SEO or pay per click method for the different search engines that are out there? So when you're building a website, do you have to create the content tailored to Google, but also create it tailored to, you know, I don't know, Bing or Yahoo's algorithm? Not that anyone's really searching on on those too often, but yeah, um, Bing has some some different things from an SEO standpoint that you have to, to watch for, but it's not necessarily different, it's just extra. Um, if just making sure that you're claimed with their webmaster tools and making sure you're indexed over there. Um, but from a pay-per-click standpoint, what's kind of funny is Bing literally copied uh, Google. So much so, and there's no no problem with that because Google did a fantastic job. I mean, everybody's copying everybody, so. Yeah, but know. so much so <laughs> to where when you're inside and you set up a new Bing account, there's a little button at the top that says copy from AdWords. And you can click <laughs> on it and import your entire campaign over. Uh, now, bid adjustments are pretty, uh, you have to adjust quite a bit lower for Bing because there's not as many searches. So you don't have as many people searching for it, not as many people in the auction. So you're going to pay less per mm. click usually on average with Bing. So let's kind of shift gears then and, and get away from uh, SEO and pay-per-click and talk a little bit about uh, social media advertising. I, I see a big pivot coming, you know, with uh, Facebook and advertising there, but even more so on Instagram. I'm, I'm having ads that are popping up constantly. Mm -hmm. I've bought, I've purchased sunglasses, shoes, uh, clothes, all through actually Instagram ads. Mm -hmm. um, and I never thought that, that I would do that. So, you know, where do you see kind of the future going with, with advertising on social media? Oh, it's going to continue to, to be refined. Right now what we're seeing is a very saturated advertising space on Facebook, Instagram, um, because everybody's coming to the game. There's a lot of people that were already there. Well, now everybody's over there and they're trying to steal that impression share and be very relevant mm -hmm. for and, and stand out. It's still tough to stand out. It's going to continue to change because Facebook wants to make sure that they're giving the user the best experience. And yeah, I get it. They make a ton of money off of ads. But if you and I aren't spending the same amount of time a day on there and they start seeing that dip, they're going to start cutting out 
the impressions for ads and then you're going to start seeing advertisers pay more because there's less impressions and there's more people bidding on those impressions. Uh, so that can what's going to change is they're going to get better. Can you dumb that down for me? I, cause mm -hmm. I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> um, so since everybody now is advertising on Facebook and you're seeing a lot of ads like you yeah. are, what they're looking at is an analytic to see what the average user per day spends or how much time they spend on Facebook. If that number starts to go down, which I think it will, because they're seeing so much advertising, then Facebook will make changes, meaning Would they I, won't show as many ads. Sure. And, you know, with people being upset and irritated with Facebook, you know, recently. Right. Um, and, and that's another thing. Facebook's really tightened up right now. And, and you see that in anything. Anytime something uh, happens on a large legal scale, which like they've gone through, they're going to tighten up like crazy. Mm -hmm. We had a ton of ads uh, in the mortgage space and in the real estate space that used to get approved, no problem. Uh, health clubs, same kind of thing. You know, you can't make, we never made any guarantees, but you couldn't even say you could lose weight if you ate right and exercised. Um, so you had to really just dumb everything down, go through this crazy approval process that we're going through right now to get things reapproved that were fine for a long time. And this is just Facebook. Just Facebook. So they're tightening up because of all these regulations and stuff they're going through, but eventually it'll loosen up again. That's just, you know, the nature of it. Sure. I mean, Mer the America's memory is is very short. Yes. And so they'll get angry or upset about something else and Facebook will be out of uh, out of trouble and right. people will be mad, uh, you know, over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, Facebook has just fascinated me because where else are they going to go that they've got that much information and oh. that big of an audience that they're talking with? I mean, yeah, there's Instagram and that's huge and that's growing like crazy, but there's a different intent on Instagram. Well, I, I argue that if you're getting something for free, mm -hmm. something like Facebook or Instagram, that the product is you, 100%. that you're the product yeah. and people just need to accept that. Yeah. I, I have no problem. Just like you said, you bought stuff, I bought stuff, and I, I kind of like the stuff I'm targeted with because right? it means they're paying attention. Yeah. It's relevant to me. Yeah. I, I didn't, you know, I bought these sunglasses that look exactly like Ray-Bans, but they were $20, mm -hmm. and I was able to buy like three or four different pairs t to wear depending on what clothes I'm wearing, yeah. and it was all because it was a targeted ad on, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. That's exactly super it. relevant. It goes back to audience and they picked out you as an audience because I'm sure they saw things in your profile that you've liked before, pages you've liked, intense. Um, you know, they'll look at whether you're married or not, whether you have kids, your political views, all that stuff. In fact, in Facebook, in the settings, you can see all that stuff that they have about you. Oh, yeah. And it's cool because, you know, usually it's true. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's almost, it seems like we're getting into the, the realm of advertising that's almost like minority report, you know? Uh, yeah. I remember in that movie, he walks into like the gap or something mm -hmm. and it uses, you know, uh, I don't think it was facial recognition, mm -hmm. but it was his eyes and it, uh, you know, talked to him about the, the last purchase that he had. Uh, this like AI thing came up about mm -hmm. it, the purchase that he did. Uh, and if you'd like to buy more and told him where it was at, and it was all just based on, on him walking into the store. Um, I don't think we're too far away from, from that kind of stuff. No, I, I don't either. I mean, in, if you think about it, like Nike, right? I, I like my Nikes, and I'm not talking about any of the drama that they've gone through. I just happen to like these shoes. <laughs> uh, I would hope that they've registered that I have those shoes, and at some point, if they came in and I just signed in an iPad when I walk into the Nike store, why wouldn't I want them to give me some suggestions of things that Absolutely. I would like? Yeah. Rather than me trying to peruse a bunch of stuff, they know I like blue because everything I buy for <laughs> shoes are, are blue. Uh, they know my, my shoe size. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, it's, it's making the experience better. And as long as the, you know, the intelligence is trying to make your experience better, that's what business is all, all about, right? The only experience I don't, I'm not a fan of is when I do go to one of those sites and I'm like, oh, I like those, but I don't really want to buy them right now. Mm -hmm. It follows me around the internet for months and my willpower, you know, I'd like to think it's pretty good, but eventually those ads beat you down and you're like, yeah. fine, I will buy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and retargeting, right? That, yeah. That's exactly what it is. Um, and it's so important that businesses are doing that. If you're selling a product or you have something that you want to continue to stay in front of, if they've gone to your website, they've shown intent for whatever you do. 
Yeah. So why not follow them with that same message? Because they raised their hand at one point. Why not be there when they're ready to raise their hand again? So if you're, this is all like really complicated stuff. So if you're a small business owner Mm -hmm. and uh, you're just getting started or, or even if you've been in business for a long time and this stuff is also just overwhelming, you know, what advice do you have for people to, to get started? Yeah. I mean, most people are started to a degree. So what I would recommend is you have someone from the outside come in and look at what you're doing. Uh, I'll use my business for as an example. I've been I'm sure in you know it well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been in business a little over 10 years. Um, a lot of the processes and things that we have in place today are things that have come out of a need that we just put in place and that we've built a company on. Well, recently I took on a partner a year ago and we've looked at all the things that we that I did uh, at a necessity and we've changed a lot of it to make the business run better, to run more smoothly. Things I didn't think about because I was so inside the wheel yeah. um, that until you have that outside perspective, you don't even know that something could work better because you're not thinking about it. So have someone come in, look at what you're doing, look at your uh, what kind of advertising you're, you're running. Maybe you're doing direct mail and maybe it's working great. Or maybe there's something you could pair it with, like, you know, a geofencing ad. Or maybe you're doing pay-per-click, but you need someone to look at the account just to make sure that you're paying as little per click as possible and that you're getting the conversions. Or maybe you're not doing any of that, and you're like, okay, well, most of my business is 100% referral. How can I get more out of my referral business? Sure. What are you doing with email marketing right now? What are you doing with creating custom audiences on Facebook with your current customer profile? And making sure that you're in front of them throughout the year because you can do that. I would argue that the best CRM system on the planet is Facebook. Uh, and yeah. I think that they built that without even, without that in mind mm-hmm. as being a CRM. And I know for, for my business that it's the, mo- the easiest, most effective way to stay in front and in contact with everybody that I care about. And yeah. everybody that I've worked with before. Um, and constantly staying top of mind. I do find it challenging. It's a very fine line to walk, though, mm-hmm. providing value and being annoying mm-hmm. and being able to balance that and make sure that you're providing the, the right content that you don't come off as, you know, a beggar mm-hmm. and at constantly asking for, for business or for sales. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what advice do you give to people to... Um, to to not come off that way to avoid being annoying to avoid being annoying so in marketing the there's two big things reach and frequency uh reach means the size of audience you're looking at frequency is how many times you're hitting that same person in the audience the rule of thumb is is you want to stay in front of your audience at least seven times to have an effect if seven times, seven, like what's that time? Seven times over the course of a day, a, a year, over the course of a, a month is okay. where the stat is, right? So, you know, if you're running a Facebook ad, you want to hit that same person, you know, seven times in a month, unless it's a, let's say it's a crazy sale that you have going on, you're blowing out all the sunglasses in the world, but it's only <laughs> going on to tomorrow. You know, your frequency could be seven times in that day. But after that point, it does start to get a little bit annoying. Unless it is has nothing to do with the sale. Gary V wrote a, a great book. You and I both read it. Jab, mm-hmm. jab, jab, right hook. And he talks about those jabs every day. Letting people, it's value, 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 value. And then finally, ask. ask exactly. Yep. So if you are always going at it with the intention of how can I add value to my audience, really you don't become annoying unless they just don't like what you do. Um, or they don't like you. And if that's the case... They're not going to buy from you anyway. Well, and they can unsubscribe and block Absol- you. And, and Absolutely. There is a button. I'm pretty sure every platform has that ability yeah. to unsubscribe and block those, mm-hmm. those ads that aren't relevant to you. Yep. And so to answer your question, just always go at it with what kind of value. You know, what, what you're doing here, I love it. I see a lot of your stuff, um, a lot of the stuff that comes out every time. I'll see it a couple times, and I love it because it's always value. I saw your market report today, um, and it was cool. One and a half percent, I think, is what you said. Mm-hmm. Um, the property is, values uh, or that sales dipped over the last, uh, I think, four months. Yeah, it was but only one point five percent. Yeah, exactly. And like, I got value out of that, and I look at all those because it's something that interests me. And if even if it's not something that interests me on something else, I just might not watch that, and I'll wait for the next seg- segment that comes out that I do. So where do you see kind of 
the future of marketing going? So, you know, all the big boys mm -hmm. out there, you know, they all did SEO and they pushed all the small guys out. Mm -hmm. And then they all started doing pay-per-click and started, you know, driving up the cost for mm -hmm. those numbers. All the small guys kind of shift over to Facebook and social media. You know, where do you see that continuing to, to go? It's going to get smarter. Um, so I mentioned earlier, you have your intentional marketing, pay-per-click marketing, but then you have your interruption marketing. Facebook falls under that display advertising. Uh, what's going to happen is just going to continue to get smarter. So advertisers are going to make sure that both your intentional and your interruption have the right balance because you always want to show up when somebody's looking for your product. That's, yeah. So pay-per-click isn't going to go away, but you also want to show up when you have the most likelihood of having a conversion. So let's say, for example, you know that the best time for home sales are, what would you say, February, March time? Frame? January through June, roughly, Okay, Phoenix. So you, if you wanted to, to build up a great pipeline, you would probably start about now, now, right? So 90 days. So you're really building up into the new year. But if you know that October through December is super slow, maybe you don't spend as much money in pay-per-click marketing during those slow months and you spend more time with your current sphere doing things like email marketing or even, you know, your Facebook so that you're with them. And then, you know, you kick into gear trying to get more leads towards the end of the year to build up 2019. So those now, that was just total speculation. I sure. just threw that out there. But that's what's going to happen is data is going to tell us that. And we're going to get smarter and smarter as marketers. And uh, Gary Vee said something that always makes me laugh. Marketers ruin everything. <laughs> that's so the true. second you think you have something figured out and it happens to us all the time, like, oh, that's not working as well as it was. And then you figure it out again, but then all the marketers figure it out and then they all do the same thing and they ruin it. And then yep. you got to figure out the next thing. So that's why it's always evolving and you have to really rely on people that know what they're doing. So you mentioned email marketing. So that's still a, a thing? It is still a thing. Um, email marketing, the open rates are far less than they were five years ago, uh, way less than they were 10 years ago, but it's still a very important medium to communicate with people. Uh, you know, there's some things you can do to make sure that you are relevant. Mm -hmm. um, number one, make sure that they want to hear from you. Uh, there, there is something to be said about sending out emails to people that maybe don't know who you are, but fit an audience, but your expectation needs to be that 1% is going to be what I'm going to get out of that. You might have a five to 10% open rate, which is terrible in email marketing, yeah. but 1% your expectation. But if it's an audience like you have people that you've sold homes to that you're staying in front of, yeah, it's very important because even if they don't open your email and they're seeing that myriad once a month or a couple times a month, they're still resonating with you. They still had a good experience. And when they are ready to refer somebody over or their cycles come up to where they're ready to buy a new home and sell theirs, they're going to think of you. And they've been seeing you consistently. So we, we changed our email marketing and we're doing it weekly now. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of trying to provide so much content all at once, mm -hmm. We tried to hone, like bring it down, simplify it, and provide higher quality content on a more, uh, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, our click through rate went up okay. by starting to do it weekly, which I found super interesting. I thought it, you know, we were running the risk of again coming off annoying and it potentially going down. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we shifted and we started adding things, you know, like uh, where interest rates are with mortgages, what's mm -hmm. going on in Phoenix, sports scores for the local teams, mm -hmm. and, and just trying to add some, some additional value to it. Um, so I just I found that super interesting that our click-through rate went up by shifting to weekly e-newsletters. Yeah. That's that's awesome. And, you know, you're also getting four impressions instead of one impression a month. Right. So that's that's awesome. I did, I'm surprised that it went up. Um, but then again, it's a smart move. Not everybody would make that move. Yeah. Uh, just thought we'd give it a shot. Yeah. And it seemed to pay off. Is there anything you know, I know that you specialize in digital marketing. Is there anything in the print world that you think is still effective and that uh, business owners should still continue to implement? Yeah, um, specialty print. I'll give you a, an example. So we've got a customer, and they are lenders, uh, but more like hard money lenders. So they they are in the Scotsman Guide, right? So there's a very specific print piece for uh, an industry. 
um, you know, one of my friends owns a company called Welcome Home AZ Magazine, and it's literally only mailed out to people that just bought a home, and it's for the first year that they own that home. So if you're in that magazine, and I've got actually a couple customers in that magazine, you know, they get pretty good referrals. Now, granted, you want to be someone that's in the blind and shutter business or maybe in the flooring, somewhere in the, the home. So, yeah, print can be good as long as it's very niche and, and specific. Um, but if it's if it's not, then it's going to be tough because your, your audience with print newspapers is far lower than it used yeah. to be. We did to uh, – against – other people's advice, we did a print marketing campaign over the last year mm -hmm. targeting a specific area in, in Phoenix and spent money on uh, sending out mailers to, you know, using uh, some sort of algorithm to kind of try and dictate who might be in the market to sell or buy a home, mm -hmm. um, probably based on what they do online. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would advertise and mail to those individuals, and then we would also advertise in, in the local newspaper that went out there. And we did that for a year straight and got zero. Zero? Zero, yeah, zero return on our investment. Um, and, you know, I had to learn the hard way that uh, – it probably to break in and, and to make that impactful, you have to do it. Probably, I would guess for longer than a year, probably for for several, and it's a very costly um, it, thing it, to take on. Absolutely, you know. But things that you can do with that. One, there is a certain branding element to it, so I get it. There was zero ROI. But think about adding like a, a geofencing, right? So basically you fence an area that same neighborhood and now mm -hmm. you're showing display advertising to a specific audience. You fence it online? Yeah, uh, yeah. so we, we use um, a, what's called a DSP. Um, they basically have the algorithm that buys all of the display advertising out there and you set the parameters on where it can show the ads, but now you're hitting people on their mobile phone in that same area that you've just done a mail or you know, the newspaper. So you're getting an, a frequency there and something that you know they're on. So you know, there's, there's things you can do. I'm not gonna say print is completely dead, but yeah, something, it's gotta be very specific and niche, and whereas what you did was, I would have tried it, and that's business, right? So I've done a lot of things that yeah, just trial didn't work. and error. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that didn't work. I'm going to cross that off I, the list yeah, and exactly. we'll go on to the next one. Anybody ever asked me, I'm going to say, I was terrible. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to recommend anybody does what, you know, you just did um, because of that. And that's, that's a kind of an off topic, but being able to share ideas with business people mm -hmm. that are out there hustling, growing their business is extremely valuable too. So, you know, I, I recommend people getting into some sort of, you know, group that's like minded and can share marketing ideas. Absolutely. Uh, I think as we shift more and more, online i think the the interaction the face-to-face -face will become even more valuable mm -hmm. absolutely so i mean it based on everything that you're saying marketing you know we 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 follow a lot of the same people and and i think uh you know you've mentioned gary vaynerchuk several times and and he basically says that all entrepreneurs need to be your marketing you're a marketer, you're mm -hmm. a content creator. You know, you might be selling widgets, but you are marketing yourself, you're marketing your company. Um, you know, so how, how does one, you know, try to tackle and take on some of these things if they're just a, you know, a sole proprietor on their own and they don't have the ability to spend mm -hmm. tons and tons of money on hiring somebody to do it for them? Yeah. You know, I'll take you back to when, uh, say, eight years ago. So a couple of years of my business, I'm sitting there on a couch. I'm building websites myself, a uh, company of one. And uh, I wish I would have been more into Facebook and more into engaging there because really what I was doing is just for my customers. I was trying to build one website at a time. What I would have been doing is actually showing people the process of what I was doing and then sharing that out to Facebook. Granted, it would have been to my friends at, at that time. Instagram didn't even exist really at that point. Right. Um, but well, people would Facebook have, was probably just for college kids at that time. No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty much, right? Um, but I, I think back to it, and if it were today and I was doing that, what I would do is I'd be showing everything I'm doing to help my, even if it's customer of one, what I'm doing to help them. And, and, and as you do that and you're showing how um, you're helping your customers succeed, you're being innovative, maybe you're sharing something that you just learned, 
that's a certain brand. You're talking about people are becoming a brand themselves. Right. And that's, that's huge. Um, I know a lot of, and I won't say any names, but I look at them and I look at their online brand, so to speak. And then I, I look at what they've actually done for people. I'm like, wow, I can't believe you make as much money as you do. They did it because that's the time that we're in right now. Yeah. And Gary V wrote it. He wrote another book and uh, crushing it. Great book. And the audio book's cool because it's uh, he just redid that last year. But you hear all those success stories of people that were on YouTube and and all they were doing is starting out and doing something. Right. They got their phone. They got the video from their phone. They started talking to it. They learned some editing tips and then they uploaded it. And was it terrible in the beginning? Of course it was. I think that's a real, I want to like pause there and, and focus on what you just said is that getting the content out there is the most important thing yeah. and trying to make it absolutely perfect, especially the first time is, is not reasonable to think. And regardless of what it looks like, you just need to get it out there. Yeah. And understanding that the first one's going to suck, the second one's going to suck, the third mm -hmm. one's going to suck a little bit less, and you're progressively going to get better the more reps, the more times you do it, just like anything else. So just getting that information out there, getting that content out there is kind of step one. Right. And, and as human beings, it's so hard for us to do that, to say, no, I'm going to put out something. This is uncomfortable for me. Like, that people, <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm going to put out something that people may not like. What's the worst that can happen? They're not going to like it. It doesn't matter how great it could have been. They still might not have liked it. Mm -hmm. But then you didn't have that that reached the one person that was like, man, I saw that video you did and it really touched me. I had, So I started, uh, it's called Aftershock uh, Weekly. And it's a weekly video I've done for a little over a year and a half with my brother. Yeah. And I was awful in the beginning. And I mean, just terrible. I look back at some of those and I'm like, what was I thinking? But I'm glad I did it because mm -hmm. I stayed consistent with that. And I think now we're in episode 75 and I've had a ton of people come up to me just randomly that I was friends on Facebook. But when I saw them in person, man, I see your videos all the time. It's, oh, I, I got a ton out of this. I'm like, really? Wow. And, and it makes you, you feel good, but it's also gotten business in. Yeah. So that's the thing. I, I knew that it wasn't going to be great, but I've... As a business owner, though, I think you kind of grow that muscle in your brain to where you're willing to be uncomfortable and put yourself out there. And as you do it more and more, you're totally fine with it. So kind of just to, to wrap up and, and bring this to a head, do you have uh, um, any words of advice for those that are interested in digital marketing, that are owning their own business or kind of getting into that field? Yeah. Um, biggest advice with digital marketing is study up learn. And, and when I say study up, I don't necessarily mean go and get books because books can be outdated. Books are outdated like right away when it comes to this stuff. I now, feel like. philosophical uh, side of books, book called uh, Influence by Cialdini. He was actually a professor at ASU. Fantastic because that's more um, the psych psychological side of advertising, marketing. I love that. So that can start a foundation. But find podcasts, find um, uh, blogs that talk about recent changes in Facebook or how to set up a Facebook campaign. How, what's the best practices in pay-per-click? What's new in pay-per-click? Get in a, you know, have an insatiable uh, knowledge getting because if you're constantly learning about that stuff and then you're applying it and trying it, you're going to learn. And that's the other thing is try it, like start. Learn by doing, kind learn of trial by, by fire. Right. Great. So if anyone who is listening and has questions about digital marketing, your company, uh, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, on uh, Facebook is probably the easiest way. Uh, Joshua C. Norris is my handle after Facebook. And then my handle on Instagram is also Joshua C. Norris. You can email me, uh, josh at aftershockenterprises.com. And yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody would have. We do offer free 30-minute consultation. So if you're just getting started in business or you've been in business 20 years and you've got a big group, uh, we'd be happy to take a look at what you're doing and, and help where we can. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Josh. Appreciate yeah, you, you uh, coming on the show. Uh, awesome. Thank you guys for tuning in. This was another edition of Danny Brown Talks Phoenix, and we will catch you next time.